Hello and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to be looking at the 2017 movie from director Christopher Nolan, Dunkirk. To help us separate fact from fiction, we'll be chatting with the historical consultant on the film and author of Dunkirk, the history behind the major motion picture, Joshua Levine. Before we chat with Joshua, it's time to set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them, (laughs) it's an all-out lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, the senior most surviving officer from the Titanic helped in the Dunkirk evacuation. Number two, Churchill didn't expect anyone to evacuate from Dunkirk. Number three, people not in the Navy who took their boats signed a form to become temporary members of the Royal Navy. Got them? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode. Maybe it'll be obvious. Maybe not. Can you find out which one is a lie? We'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to chat with Joshua Levine about the historical accuracy of Dunkirk. Everyone knows movies are entertainment, so we all know that they're not supposed to be entirely accurate, and yet a lot of people still use movies as a source for their historical knowledge. So before we chat about some of these specific plot points, if you took a step back and gave the movie overall a letter grade on accuracy of the miracle at Dunkirk, what would it get? It's it's such... It's a very hard one for me to answer this because you're, in a way, you're asking <laughs> me to grade my own work, uh, and obviously not because it's not my movie, and you know, it was, you know, I, I could, I could advise, but obviously, you know, the, the the director Christopher Nolan made made the film he wanted to make and was, you know, made every single choice. But on the other hand, clearly, I am implicated in in in, in this in some way. But I have to say, I was very pleased um, with. You know, I was there when it was filmed, and um, uh, you know, I was there for, for 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 most of the way, and I was very pleased with 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 how it came out and how it looked, and and I would I would give it an optimistic B plus. I think um, I think it I I I think he was very, you know, he took a lot of care with 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 the things that really mattered to him, and the work. You know, there were things that were wrong. Um, often, funnily enough, not the things that people, you know, obviously the, the, the film ga- gained a lot of uh, attention and interest and people were very, with a lot of articles and, you know, this is r- r- right, this is wrong, historical accuracy. And often <laughs> those articles were wrong, you know, pointed out that were mistakes, were not mistakes. And then there were things that nobody seen or that I, there were mistakes that nobody seemed to, to, to spot. Um, uh, so, so for example, I mean, there was, there was, um, you know, the, the, the train carriage at the end, um, was a, a, a good old 1970s, um, <laughs> British train carriage, you know, but I don't see anyone spot that. So I think I'm revealing that. Uh, yeah. But, um, and then, you know, the, and then there were, there were some things that weren't, were a matter of, uh, choice and sort of. So, for you know, the, the one thing that was I found really interesting was, you know, the the, the director was keen to find out about, for example, women uh, at Dunkirk, and there were a lot of women on on the hospital ships, um, um, you know, nurses, uh, and there were stewardesses on on some of the the, the passenger ships that, that came across. Um, I didn't find any women on. The little ships, you know. Yeah, I think he would have. He would have liked there to have been a, a woman on a little ship. Um, I didn't find that, so I gave. You know, I. I, I funnily enough, there was an article in I had did find in in the Times, London Times, on um, I think it was the sixth of, of of June, nineteen forty, talking about there having been um, a woman who took a, a, a boat across to Dunkirk, 
And the article said that she had phoned up the Admiralty, this woman phoned up the Admiralty, asking to take a ship across, to take her own boat across. And she'd done it in a, in a false voice. And she, she deepened her voice. So well, I go to take a boat across. And, and the Admiralty had said yes, and she'd done it. Um, these were the sorts of stories that were flying around, sort of rumors that were flying around in the days and weeks after Dunkirk, in days and weeks after any kind of a, a, a event like that, I suppose. Um, and so I, I showed him the article and said to him, I don't, I suspect this probably isn't true. It's a sort of story that's flying around. But, you know, I gave it to him to, you know, do, do, do what you, 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 you will with it. Um, then there were also, you know, I was looking for, um, uh, uh, black pe black soldiers, and this was a point before um, Commonwealth troops had you know become in, in, involved. So, um, what I found two mixed race soldiers, one who was killed before Dunkirk, one who was taken prisoner um, afterwards, um, and I told him, you know, that that's the information that I that I gave him, and and then there was the matter of the. Quite an interesting matter, I suppose, of the of the Indian um, soldiers. I mean, there, there were four Indian companies, um, uh, animal transport companies in in France. Um, but of those four, only one was actually at Dunkirk. One company, which was comprised of, I think, three officers and two hundred ninety eight men, um, uh, the twenty fifth. Uh, annual transport company actually made it off the mole, big non-jetty, um, uh, on, I think it was the night of the 28th, 29th um, of May, but it's on, you know, early in the morning of the 29th. And um, so there were, there, were in, there were Indian soldiers at Dunkirk on the beaches, you know, or making their way to the mole. And again, I told him that. So, you know, and then there was a lot of criticism afterwards that Indian soldiers had not mm. been portrayed in the film. Um, so that you know, that's a whole debate to be had, and that's a debate about where we are in terms of filmmaking and culture, and, and you know, the, 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 you know what 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 should be shown in relation to what can be shown. Um, but again, I, that you know, that's the information uh, I gave. So so there was you know some things are you know factually right, factually wrong. Um, you know, the, the, the naval men on the mole should have been wearing helmets. They would have been wearing helmets. He, he didn't want to show them an helmet. There was also the you know the 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 point about the, the the town of Dunkirk, which you only saw briefly, um, but not being mm. beaten up enough, which I, I think is true. Um, but then, you know, the director doesn't particularly like to use, or doesn't at all like to use CGI. Um, and, you know, he wasn't going to bomb the, the actual town. Um, and, and then the numbers of soldiers on the beaches, which, I mean... You know, uh, I think a lot of people said beaches weren't messy enough; they weren't crowded enough. Um, and again, there's some truth to that, but you've got to be careful with this because, I mean, you can look at this two ways. But, I mean, first of all, um, in fact, he did. You know, he again doesn't use CGI, but he did use a thousand local people, local, you know, young people dressed in uniforms, and and um, um, and, and and he, you know, used them. Actually, a lot on, on on the beaches, so you know he made them as crowded as conceivably he could, I think. Um, but then the other point is they weren't always crowded, and we tend to think of, you know, there's, there's this idea of the the evacuation as being a certain thing. The story is one certain thing, and the, and the truth is that like all history, like all stories, like everything that's happened in the past, there is not one story. And if you look at the accounts of, of different, you know, as I have looked over the years, at many, many accounts and talked to many, many veterans. And yes, there were points when the beaches were absolutely cluttered and crowded and there were queues and the queues would disappear when the dive bombers came over and then reappear. And, but there were also periods, and, and, and bear in mind also, you've got 10 miles of beaches. You've got this evacuation happening for, for days and days and days. You've got hundreds of thousands of people coming and going, coming and going. So the, the, there is no one story. The whole world was on the beaches, and there were periods when there weren't many people at particular places. And in fact, they were empty at particular places at different times. Different, and and there were times when the sun was shining and people were having a great time. Um, and you know, there was a 
man telling me about a circus performer um, who was on, found a horse and on the back of a horse and performing tricks and men were all lying in the sunshine clapping and, and, and cheering as this man, you know, performed on a horse, which is not our picture of what Dunkirk was actually like. Um, and, uh, you know, the, there were times, uh, the, and another man told me, you know, I had horror stories of people coming on the beaches after days of evacuation, terrible physical states and hungry and, and hadn't eaten for days. And one man who sort of sunk to his knees and um, uh, I took his helmet off and started to try and eat the leather strap on his helmet because his imagination couldn't go anywhere. He was so hungry and he didn't know what, what he could, you know, his mind just focused in on the first thing it focused in on. Um, and, 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 you know, another story of some of you watching a group of men all sitting around in a circle or miming eating hmm. with a, an imaginary knife and fork and just, you know, they, was, they couldn't get any food, but this was the, the closest they could come. And they, all, they were all sort of engaged in this, in this sort of shared pantomime um, uh, that it was deadly serious. And, but on the other hand, I, 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 I got the story of these three royal engineers who came off, you know, the, off the retreat and came onto the, the beach and found there were no boats coming in. So they went back out. I don't think beyond the perimeter. I think within the perimeter. But they found an estaminet, like a bar, cafe, open. And this is during the evacuation. They said not only was it open, they were able to buy a bottle of champagne, which they drank. These were ordinary Englishmen, you know, wouldn't have touched champagne before in their lives. And they drank it and they decided they loved it. They're going to have more of it in their lives with them. Finished it, went back onto the beach. A boat came in, took them off, um, took them up to something bigger offshore, and, and home they went. Again, not the typical Dunkirk story. But my point is simply that there was no one story, and there never is. Um, and, and we're making a mistake to, to think that the, you know, there, there is only one story. And, and so it was, um, you know, there was good behavior, there was bad behavior, there were people standing order, in orderly lines in queues, and then there were also people jumping queues and a couple of accounts of people being shot when they tried to jump the queue to get on little boats. And so, you know, th there was everything going. There was a man who found an ambulance and just just got in it and stayed for days inside in his own little bubble, in, you know, on at the top of the beach inside this this ambulance and then sort of tried to shut the rest of the world out and mm. pretend nothing else was happening. So there's no one story and, and equally, um, you know, there's no one picture of the beach that is uh, correct. So that's an incredibly long way of saying <laughs> I give it a beat. Well, I mean, it, I mean, movies are entertainment, right? And you, and as filmmakers, you have to choose which stories you're going to focus on. And so it makes sense that, I mean, yeah, there's, if there's no one story, you're going to have to choose. And, no matter what you choose, there are going to be some people that aren't going to like what you cho what you didn't pick, or you know, in, in that way. What stories you didn't tell? I mean, because you can't tell everything. They only have so much time. So, I mean, you talk to veterans. It's always very interesting talking to veterans because they they will have had their experience, and very often they are not willing to accept the experience of another oh. veteran who had a different experience. Yeah. You know, so you you know you you obviously you're not you're never rude. To, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would never sort of contradict a veteran, but you had to be aware that somebody who had, you know, lived through something to them, that was the, the truth of the matter. That was the reality of the matter. Um, and if you put somebody else's reality to them, they would sometimes just say, no, no, I accept that that didn't happen. And that, you know, we all, we're all like that. I mean, we all, you know, you go into into a, a court and watch a case over a traffic accident and you know you 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 say what you saw and that won't be the same as what the person you know 30 feet away saw um it's just that's it's, it's how how it is and um so so you know you it, it's actually quite fascinating when you do speak to you know large numbers of people and try and get a sense of what it was um from so many um, different accounts, and it becomes something far more interesting, and, and you know, far, far less 
cliched really than 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 you know what it might otherwise have become uh, uh, right, turned right. into over time. Well, at the at the beginning of the movie, there is some text that explains the British and French armies have been driven to the sea. That kind of sets up the, them being trapped at Dunkirk, kind of hoping for the miracle. But other than the text, the movie just kind of throws us into that story, which makes sense. I mean, it's it's about that story. Uh, but can you explain a little bit more on the historical side? to kind of set that up, you know, why, why were the British and the French armies surrounded by the Germans at Dunkirk? Yeah, sure. Well, I just, I, I mean, just before I do, it might be interesting. I, I happen to have a book um, from the talk I once gave, um, copies of, I mean, one thing that the, the film, I, I, mean, I don't want to speak for the director, but I, I, you know, he, 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 he didn't want to use too much dialogue. Um, and, and so one thing that, I think he found it useful. I told him about the um, the uh, uh, leaflets that the Germans dropped, mm -hmm. um, and you know, all, all sides dropped um, uh, propaganda leaflets, but the Germans dropped these. These are these are copies of the oh, wow. of the real leaflet, um, and and it's not the scale. I mean, it's much bigger than the actual leaflet. But it, this is what he put in at the beginning, except he didn't put in the actual. I mean, you can see. Say British soldiers, look at this map. It gives your true situation. Your troops are entirely surrounded. Stop fighting. Put down your arms. Um, and what he turned into, for the purposes of the right at the top of the film, was mm -hmm. this, which you can see. I mean, it it it, it, it filmically, it's great because it cuts out the need for a lot of clunky dialogue about where are we? We're, you know, we're here. Why are we? You know, it's you know, you. We surround you. And actually, in reality, when I spoke to veterans, I mean, they said that, that you know this thing was useful for, and can you put this in for two for two reasons? One, they didn't have <laughs> toilet paper, but two also, yeah. um, they didn't have maps, and the Germans dropped them a map, <laughs> and it was really you know this is yeah. <laughs> this is great, thanks. I mean, yeah. um, so anyway, so that that's and that kind of you know preempts the. The story, but basically, the, I mean, the British Expeditionary Force had arrived in in France right at the beginning of the war. Within days, started arriving within days of the beginning of the war. You had all of these, um, you know, young young men whose fathers and uncles and relatives and you know older men they knew had been out there, you know, just a generation previously to these you know same places. Um, so it was a kind of here we go again. Um, and they came to France. They didn't move into Belgium. Belgium was, even though the attack was expected to come, the Germans were expected to attack through Belgium, they were expected to come into Belgium. But the Belgians didn't want the Allies to set foot in Belgium because they didn't want to provoke the Germans into attacking, even though they expected the Germans would attack anyway. They didn't want to actually you know, lay out the carpet for them by provoking them. So, the, the British Expeditionary Force remained in France, um, and then for, for months, what was known as well, the Americanism was the the, the phony war, but I think the British knew it more as the at the time as the the mm. boar, the boar, you know, on the boar, um, b o r e, as in there was nothing happening. But actually, they, you know, they were quite a lot of if you think about it, these young British men, um, never been abroad before, very very few of them been abroad before. And they'd been brought up during the Depression, and the army gave them regular meals and income, uh, and now adventure. And they were, they were actually going abroad to see how, you know, how other people, you know, what abroad was like. Um, and, uh, and, and they stay, you know, in fact, the, the, to show that they enjoyed. I mean, I found a, there was a, a battalion of the, of the Middlesex Regiment that um, uh, was started misbehave and was told that if you, this was in, November, December of 1940, and told them, if you don't start behaving, we're sending you back to England. And they started behaving. They cut it. They cut out the back. They, they wanted to stay, um, and and so they the, the the idea was that the you know the expectation was there would be a German attack um, through Belgium. The, the 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 British and the French would move up to meet uh, the, the the Germans in Belgium, and there would be kind of a repeat of the First World War, a, a war of sort of mud and trenches and. And, and 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 not a great deal of movement, um, and the French also had this large uh, called, something called the Maginot Line, which was a series of fortifications, really heavily um, 
uh, defended fortifications um, along the border with Germany. And the, the French French cry was, um, you know, pass on par, they will not pass, um, because they believed it was completely impregnable, it wouldn't come through. Um, and what the Germans did, uh, which was very audacious, and, and Hitler basically signed off on this, and, and, and maybe, you know, you could argue that his part of his hubris was a result of the success of this, why he never again doubted himself, um, was that they, they did indeed attack into um, Belgium, um, and the British came forward to meet them on the River Deal, and two sides uh, met. But at the same time, that was only a feint, really, by the Germans. A real attack was um, was coming through the Ardennes, which is a, a hilly area, a, a heavily forested area, an area that, in theory, was impassable to tanks. So the Germans didn't try and get past the, the Maginot Line. The only pass on bar, they didn't pass, they didn't try. They came instead through through the Ardennes, and it wasn't um, defended properly by, by the French, and the Germans just amazingly sort of hmm. shot through um and by the 20th of may um german tanks had reached the, the the french coast um and so almost surrounded um the completely surrounded the the um british expeditionary force which found itself then retreating um and so the, the retreat started Sort of piecemeal, so from one river line, you know, from Deal to the River Esco, and, and fighting on all these, you know, heavy fighting on all these uh, these lines. And then, as the retreat went further back, the British were setting up um, defended areas. So uh, first of all, along the corridor, so defending canals and defending um, defendable areas, so that the, the Germans couldn't couldn't get through. Um, and and further back, further back, until eventually they were. They found themselves, and with, along with the French as well, both British and the French, were defending the perimeter uh, around Dunkirk as the evacuation moved further back. And you had a situation where the British actually did mount a, 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 a counterattack uh, on the 21st of May. So the, the, the main attack came, the attack began on the 10th of May. By the 20th of May, the, the Germans had, had, had reached the coast. The British then mounted this um uh, counterattack at Arras, which was surprisingly successful, um, and actually really spooked the Germans, who really only saved the day because Rommel, you know, the, the legendary Rommel, this is where he kind of um, made his name, if you like, it, it took personal control um, and um, uh, uh, basically um, beat, beat off the British attack. But it was sufficiently successful that it made the Germans very nervous that you know, another counterattack in force could, you know, ev effectively cut off the panzer tanks so that we were to the coast. Because the tanks, if you think about it, you know, they, they were now in, in quite a bad mechanical state. They got way ahead of the infantry, way ahead of their supplies. They were coming to, you know, the area around Dunkirk, which was marshy anyway. There wouldn't be much use in Dunkirk. The Germans thought a bigger fight was still coming to the south of the Somme. Um, they thought there was, you know, a big fight against the French. Uh, was still coming. And so they stopped the tanks. Um, well, Runs did, first of all, stop the tanks. And then that order was confirmed by Hitler. And that, that confirmation had quite a lot to do with um, Hermann Goering basically making contact with, with, with Hitler and saying, don't let, don't let the generals um, you know, win this. The, 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 the generals will take credit for it and they will be right. They will end up as rivals to you. They, they are not solidly Nazi. Um, they will create trouble. They will, um, whereas if you let the Luftwaffe, we've been, we've been loyal to you from the very beginning. If you let us, we can defeat the British. So, so let us do it. Um, and that was, a, a one major reason why, um, why the, the Hitler confirmed that halting the tanks order. Um, which lasted for, for 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 three days and gave the British uh, a, a great opportunity to be able to move um, more and more and more people back through um, the corridors and and into Dunkirk. Uh, it was it's fascinating to me when you mentioned that initially these uh, British expeditionary forces are, are going abroad and the punishment is going home 
and then to contrast that uh, as yeah. to you know i mean this this just how quickly the tables turn in in that it that just stood out to me what what you were saying there that's fascinating yeah it's a, it's a really it's a, it's, a, it's a very quick story actually it's 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 um it is it is it is sort of remarkable i mean it's quick, it's very slow in terms of the the uh you know the 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 boer war and the phony war but then suddenly everything happened. You know, people were, you know, why aren't they attacking? I mean, I think Churchill's view for a lot of this time, you know, why aren't they attacking? Are they, you know, do they have, you know, is something extraordinary going to happen? Are they suddenly, is Hitler suddenly going to launch some kind of, you know, utterly terrifying, perhaps, um, uh, you know, aerial attack on, on Britain or, you know, what, 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 what is it going to be? And what it did turn out to be was this audacious, um, you know, attack through, through the Ardennes, which, which almost gave a, you know, an, a, an immediate victory. Um, so it is, it is, it is, a, and the British soldiers didn't know why they were retreating. I mean, they, they, um, you know, they found. I mean, I think initially a lot of them, if you talk to them, a lot of them said that they, you know, they thought maybe their own unit had done something wrong and was you know, being sent back for some reason, or maybe there'd been a, an attack, you know, nearby and they were having to fall back to create, you know, to keep a line. Um, but, but, you know, at first they certainly didn't know that, you know, what had happened, but I mean, not, the commanders didn't really know what was happening at first. It was, it was, it, it, it was chaos. And one thing I should probably mention is that the man who made the decision to retreat into Dunkirk, to retreat all the way back to Dunkirk and then, Evacuate was was really was was Lord Gore, who was the commander in chief of the British Expeditionary Force, and he's not a man who gets much credit. He wasn't a very imaginative man, really, a very brave man. Um, but he and he, you know, he ended up being sort of shunted off to. I think he became governor of Gibraltar after after this. And, um, and but he made that. I think as early as the nineteenth uh, of May, you know, he was aware. You know, it was a distinct possibility that. They were going to have to go all the way back to Dunkirk, and 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 you know by the twenty fifth he he'd made the decision that this was going to happen. They were going to have to save as many as possible of the British Expeditionary Force through this evacuation, and this was at a point. Bear in mind when you know back in London, uh, the generals back in London, certainly Churchill was still talking about you know no no you must stay and you must fight and you must mount counterattacks with the French. We cannot afford to lose. To leave France, we can't afford to lose the French, and and all this kind of thing, and 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 it was Gort who very bravely sort of overrode this and said, no, no, we 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 go back now. And that's how, you know, the the think I'm spoiling anything by saying that's how the British Expeditionary Force was saved. And and um, my goodness me, the war would have taken a different turn. I mean, the work today, living, would have taken a different turn. Um, it's you know, it's when a butterfly flaps its wings. And, and, and and Lord Gordon yeah. made that decision. Um, well, if you should, yeah. uh, the movie also shows obviously the the other side as well. And in the beginning of the movie, there's a character named Mister Dawson, uh, along with his son Peter and their friend George. And we see a couple men from the Navy who requisition Mister Dawson's boat. It's a private yacht, and they're asked to you know empty everything out of the yeah. boat, load up a bunch of life jackets. We don't really hear uh, exactly what the navy men told them, but all we know through some dialogue is they're told that some men across the English Channel at Dunkirk need taking off. So there's they don't seem to know a lot about what's going on either, but they're they're being asked. H how well did the movie do showing what it was like for the citizens kind of preparing to go across the channel? Well, I think I mean the worst the were ordinary citizens who um, uh, did take their own boats and did go across, but it, not many. I mean, the, the, the reality of the story is, and there were, I mean, you know, I think, um, you know, there the, the were, for example, there was, there was the second, the, the senior, sorry, the senior surviving officer on the Titanic, from the Titanic, uh, Michael Lightoller, you know, went across in his own, Boat and stuff, and you know that I don't know if you've seen the film Mrs. Miniver, nineteen forty-one British film. You know, there's a character there who just jumps in his. It, it, you know, there's a Dunkirk scene or it's a, a guy, just an ordinary guy, Mrs. Miniver's husband, jumps in his boat, comes back three days later with a beard shattered, and that's you know 
That was a film made, I think, a year, just a year after. So there was a story that developed and lots of ordinary people got in both, and a few did. But really what happened, for the most part, was that, um, that, that the Navy requisitioned boats and it took them out of boatyards along the Thames or on the south coast. People didn't know that their boats had been taken. Some did know and didn't know why their boats had been taken. One man I found who, you know, thought his boat was being stolen and chased it up to the water. Um, and, not, you know, and, and then so na naval ratings ended up taking these boats across. In, in some cases, it would have been better if the owners had taken them across because the owners knew how they were, whereas the naval ratings often, you know, wrecked them. But, um, but so, so, I mean, I think the, re the reality of the story, and also fishermen, um, you know, a lot of fishermen did take their own boats, and 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 um, and and, and non-members of the navy took their boats. Um, ended up signing a form that made them temporary members of the royal navy. Um, it was called T, what number? It was a T T one two four, I think, and it was a form they signed. And so for a, a month, I think they they were members of the they they were considered um, members of the royal navy. Um, so people did, you know, people did sign this form. People did 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 go across their own boat. But for the most part, um, it was it was the navy who took these boats across. And you've got to remember that um, you know the, these little known as the little ships, which started to come across in big numbers on the thirtieth and thirty first, they were really needed for taking people off the off the beaches to take them to the larger ships offshore. Um, I mean, you, so so at the beginning, you'd amaze. I mean, it is an amazing. The, the, the story is amazing. Um, you had these, you know, people had, were congregating in the the town of Dunkirk in the cellars and the, the looked up of a bombing. So as a result of what Goering had said, um, you know, because Luftwaffe really weren't. It, reality is that they weren't capable of doing what what Goering said told Hitler they they could do. Um, Maybe if the weather had stayed had been different and there was no cloud cover and you know da, 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 then and and their tactics had been slightly different and they you know bombed Dover and Ramsgate and this and the other you know maybe it would have been but the fact is they weren't as things stood they weren't capable of really of doing it and what they did the first success we did was to bomb the harbour the town and the harbour and it put the inner harbour mm. pretty much out of action I mean completely out of action actually and so. You had this uh, a man called William Tennant, who was a senior naval officer ashore at Dunkirk, who had to make this. Well, he, he had all these people, all these men, all these soldiers in Dunkirk. M more were pouring in, and the harbour was out of action. So how was he going to get? How were people going to get back to Dover, back to Ramsgate, back to Britain? And um, what he did, the whole, because the whole thing you got to understand was a kind of mm. constant improvisation. You know, constant. And to make it up on the go, uh, and um, and 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 what he did, what I think, was the sort of the, the greatest improvisation of all of anything that happened. He saw these two big sort of outer arms, the outer harbour. There's two arms that went a mile out to sea, the the west mole and the east mole, and they weren't jetties. They were basically big arms to stop the harbour silting up, um, and they did have wooden walkways on the top of them, but that. You know, they also had large railings alongside. It was just that people could walk out there. They weren't meant as jetties. They had huge um, tidal drops. I don't know, 14, 15 feet tidal drops. They had these arms. That, you know, they, no one had ever brought a, a ship alongside them. But, you know, but um, uh, Tennant looked at the situation. He, you know, he, he, people from the, har from the, um, the harbor, from the town, would moved onto the beaches. But at this point, early on in the evacuation, there weren't any well, sufficient little boats to bring people from the beach to the larger ships, which were starting to come. So you had large destroyers, naval destroyers, naval minesweepers. You had ferries, uh, um, passenger ships. But there was no way for them to come inshore and no way for the men to get out to them. So and there weren't yet enough little ships. They, you know, call went out for them. But so what he decided to do was to use these moles these huge breakwaters, specifically for the British, the East Break, the East Mole. Um, and he sent people, all, soldiers, up them, and he, he brought um, uh, a passenger ship alongside. And on that first night, 
Night of 28, you know, he got almost a, a thousand people off. And he, he realized this is, this is what we've got to do. And so the majority of soldiers actually got off using those breakwaters over the course of the vast majority, over the course of the, course of the, the, the evacuation. So it's an amazing story of, of improvisation. Um, and again, I mean, I think that came across pretty well in the film. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So uh, another perspective we get from the film is in the air, and it, it starts with there's uh, three British airplanes, one of them kind of the, the main pilot of Farrier's. Um, he talks about how they have 70 gallons of fuel uh, over the radio. They're s told to stay low to allow for 40 minutes of fighting time over Dunkirk, uh, but also make sure to keep an eye on the on the fuel so you can have enough gas to get back. Uh, and not to skip ahead in the timeline of the movie necessarily, but there are bits of dialogue throughout where the soldiers on the beaches are just wondering where where are our planes to fight off the Germans as as they're coming in and, and bombing the beaches. So the impression that I got was uh, from the movie that there wasn't a huge RAF presence in the air to protect the soldiers at Dunkirk, or at least not that they could see in you know the areas that, that we're watching in the movie. Is that a right impression to walk away from the movie with of, the RAF's role at Dunkirk. I think I think you you got the impression the film intended to to convey. I mean, which is the accurate one, which is that the, the soldiers and sailors didn't think the RAF were there. You know, they were really angry at the RAF. I mean, you know, the, it's, it's, it, this is the way stories work. I mean, you've got Dunk. The truth is that at, at Dunkirk, the soldiers and sailors were furious to the point that when RAF people either um, crash landed or whatever reason were trying to get off at Dunkirk and with the soldiers. Often they weren't allowed on, or they had to change their clothes to pretend they weren't RAF. People were so not angry with them for not being there. Um, the, I mean, if you think about it, you know, we're just talking weeks later. You've got the Battle of Britain, and they became heroes. You know, and and the legend. How quickly you know, things turn! Wow. <laughs> And, but then what we've also forgotten is that after that, um, I mean, I, I've got, I, I found a story in, in Guy Gibson, who was the, the Dam Busters, um, uh, in his autobiography about he was a night fighter, again, after the Battle of Britain, so during the Blitz in November of 1940. And he's uh, in London, dressed, he's a night fighter, so against the, flying against the bombers during the German bombers during the Blitz. And he's in London one night in his uniform. He's down in a shelter whilst the bombing is going on up above, and people start turning against him, and people were shouting at him, saying, why aren't you up there getting those, you know? And he said it was so intimidating that he would rather get out of the shelter and take his chances against the bombs because he thought people were about to attack him down in the shelter. Yeah. So this is, the reality is that, it's again, it's not, you know, it, it's waves, people. But the point is, to get back to Dunkirk, the point is, yes, the, 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 the soldiers were angry at the area, but the RF were also there. They were doing absolutely as much as they felt they could do and as much as they could. And the fact is that they, you know, they shot, the RAF shot down more German aircraft than the Germans shot down um, um, RAF aircraft. They really were there, but there were also extremely good reasons why they, they, they weren't seen. Um, there was quite a few reasons. I mean, they, they, you know, so Fighter Command, for example, um, started employing very large formations um, of two to four squadrons at, at a time. Um, and with the limited squadron resources available, that meant there were periods where there were gaps in the RAF's umbrella. So, um, you know, it added to their success rate, but it also meant that there really, you know, the RAF really was absent um, for periods of time. It, it was there, but it was absent for periods. But then also, you have lots of, you know, first of all, they were flying high. For the most part, you know, twenty thousand feet, because they wanted to be, you know, above the Germans. So that meant that they couldn't be seen. They also, um, uh, they 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 were trying to intercept the Germans mm, mm. before they got to the beaches. So a lot of the times they weren't even over the, you know, seen over the beaches. What's the point of being over the beaches once the Germans uh, are already there? You've got um, the Germans had air observers behind Dunkirk, so they could call aircraft up um uh so, you know to come into the battle zone 
Um, so, you know, for that reason, sometimes the bombers did show up when the, the, the RAF weren't there. Um, you had uh, anti-aircraft guns from the period they were there firing at everything. So the troops would look up and see everything being fired at, assuming that everything was enemy, when in fact, you know, some of them weren't enemy. Um, and, um, you know, the, there was cloud cover for part of the time. There were lots of reasons. I mean, it was lucky it was cloud cover um, because, you know, that meant that the, that the, the Germans couldn't bomb um, and that, you know, Stukas couldn't come down and, and, and do their bombing from 1,500 feet. So, so there were lots and lots of very good reasons why the British couldn't see the RAF, even though they were there and doing an unbelievably important job. And bear in mind, there were very good reasons why not all of the a fighter command was 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 being used because the British knew, doubting, knew that the bigger fight was going to come. I mean, that you know that they were going to be needed to defend. I mean, the Battle of Britain. Nobody objects to the fact that the, the RAF fighter command was was strong during the Battle of Britain, and that, you know the, the fact was they couldn't commit too much to Dunkirk because they had to reserve. Strength for the Battle of Britain, fight for yeah. Britain, because of the, the fact is that you know for the Germans to come across, they were going to have to win control of the air, and and that battle of the fighters, um, the of the Germans coming over and 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 the British fighters over the south of England was, you know, a, yeah, a fight that's for a, Britain. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. That I mean, you can't predict the future, but I mean, you know that what would be next is yeah that. There's the big battle coming next, and so you want to make sure that you have. One hopes they hope there was a big battle coming next. I mean, it, you know, it, it could have been that the, the British army was was finished off there. If the British army had been finished off there and then, it's very hard to see any other result than Britain yeah. having to sue for peace. And then again, we're in that situation where what, yeah. you know, what, where yeah. where would we be now? And and um, you know. Germany would have absolutely, you know, the whole German ethos would have bled throughout Europe. Britain wouldn't have been there to, yeah. to defend, you know, liberty, freedom, the rule of law, et cetera, et cetera. Where would the second, you know, even if America joined the war, where would the second front have come from? Um, these are all big, big, it's why, you know, Dunkirk is, for, for me, I, Dunk, it's interesting. Well, I was in Dunkirk quite recently, you know, and, and I hadn't been there since before lockdown. And, I was speaking to one of the guides, and he was saying that the Americans are now coming. It's part of the uh, the 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 the, 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 um, the tour for Americans. Americans are now coming to Dunkirk. They never used to come to Dunkirk. So, if this film has done anything, it's to increase awareness of the fact that Dunkirk wasn't just the little, you know, uh, little prosaic British bit um, that happened before America got involved. It was really unbelievably important. In the whole bigger picture of the war, um, and um, so yeah, I mean that that in a way that was the most important effect of the film I think, to me to make people across the world aware that the that Dunkirk wasn't this just this this, this little localized British fight um, that was passing time before before America got involved, and and it's also really interesting, you know, you, you look I've looked at sort of the reaction that the film has had in different countries. So, for example, I, I was reading that in China, it was not a popular film because it's not about a victory. Um, and you know, to 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 to, in, to the Chinese market, apparently, you know, um, a film about well, let's face it, a, a defeat, <laughs> you know, that, um, uh, is uh, you know, it, it just nobody's interested in watching that. Um, but it was so much more than a defeat. It was a, it was. You know this miracle of deliverance, which is not putting it too strong, um, that made victory possible. There is a moment in the movie where uh, the, the British soldiers are lined up along the mole, uh, trying to get onto the ship dock there, and we see some French soldiers coming on, and they're turned away. One of the one of the British soldiers flat out says, "This is a British ship. You have your own ships." Uh, and, and at the very end of the movie, one of the final lines is after the the British are rescued, Commander Bolton mentions that he's staying behind to help the French. Can you clarify a little more, like, were the French not allowed passage on the ships or on, on the British ships until all the British were evacuated, or how, how did that work? 
I, I don't think it was a rule. I think it, I, but I think it did happen. Um, I think the, I mean, oh gosh, the, the whole story of the French, um, I mean, you know, the, the French didn't know for a long time that the, the oh. British were evacuating. They realized that they were breaking. Um, but I think it's probably fair to say that the Germans learned before the French did, the British were, were, were evacuating. And that was one reason. And let's face it, it was a pretty bad reason why the French bore, you know, considerable grudge um, uh, against the, the British. And also, the, you know, the French did defend the perimeter. Um, you know, but the, and the French, and it is true, lot the French were, you know, some French were not allowed um, onto British ships. But it's also true that as the evacuation went on, more and more French were being allowed onto British ships and were uh, were being evacuated back to Britain. And then it's also true to say that Churchill made trips across to Paris during the evacuation. And at one, he was asked how many um how many uh, French were, were, were being evacuated, and he had to admit it wasn't many um, at that point. And he, he said that after, from this point, they will go bras de sous, bras de sous, arm in arm from this point. And the, the, the last part of the evacuation was mostly French, Belgians, others. Um, so, so somewhere between 100 and 120,000 French out of 338,000 in total um, were evacuated. So it's a really large number of French w did come back ultimately. Um, so it's a, again like so many of these things. Just you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, um, yes, French people were. I think that that is true. The French were prevented, and certainly in the early stages, from not you know on uh, from coming on ships. But but at the same time, overall, very very large numbers of French um, were evacuated. Uh, back to Britain. So, um, yeah, there's yeah. multiple there's stories, truth. like you're saying. <laughs> yeah, that, there's another conversation in the movie um, with uh, Colonel Winnett and Commander Bolton. They're on the mole and they hear gunfire in the distance. Then Germans are broken through the deans, dunes in the east. When it says, "This is it," and a few moments later, uh, Bolton looks through his binoculars and, "What do you see?" And Bolton replies, "Home." And, and you know, it's a very cinematic moment. You see it. A ton of the, the small ships uh, arriving on the shores of Dunkirk, heroic music swells. Uh, and then their the reception yeah. is, you know, military ships are blaring their sirens, boats are ho blowing their horns, the soldiers on the decks are cheering. Uh, it seems like there's this moment of, oh, you know, the the rescue is here. Was there was there this moment of like, there's this rescue, oh, we're going to be saved in, in, in that way? Well, actually... Actually, funnily enough, even though that seems completely cinematic and um, unlikely, there was a moment when the con, the sort of armada, small ships came, you know, was first spotted en masse. And I think for a, a lot of people seeing that, it really was genuine, a sort of, you know, fantastic moment of, my God, we, 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 we may be all right. Um, so again, so there is some truth to that. Um, it's, that's, that's not, I mean, Again, you know, there were, there were breakthroughs at, uh, at different points. Um, the Germans did, did, did break through in different spots, the perimeter, and, 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 and you know, so the eastern end of the beaches the, in Belgium, La Pan, um, the Panna, uh, you know, that, the, the, the perimeter shrunk um, as time went, went by. And so by the end, you know, by, by the very end of the, the evacuation, you know, the, the, the Germans were very, very close. I wouldn't say, and, you know, they were shelling. I mean, the, you know, the, from outside the perimeter to, to, to inside and, 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 and the routes that the, the boats had to take, the ships had to take when they were coming into Dunkirk, you know, depending on where the, the, the Germans had placed their guns, you know, they, they were sometimes unsafe because they could be shelled from the shore, so they had to change the routes they they took. So again, all this is to a degree true, um, and and I think that you know the, the the flotilla of little ships did appear and did you know you know cause a lot of people to just sort of think, well, but, you know, maybe we we can we 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 can get away. So again, it's not you know it's it's not fantasy. Um, it's a film, but it's not. 
I mean, I doubt anyone, you know, <laughs> used those precise words. What? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I bet. But you know, maybe they did. Um, it's it's yeah. Yeah. What, what about the timing yeah. of it? Because it seems like oh, the Germans had broken through the dunes, and the impression I got was, oh, okay, that like they're about to attack the beaches, basically. And then you see the the rescue start to happen. Was it really that close of a call there, like that? Look, they break through and and were fought off in different spots. I think the you know they they, they were when the evacuation ended, you know, on the on the fourth of June, they were really close. Um, and and um. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, again, to a degree, it's not, you know, the, the, the thing is, it is it is absolutely true that it was a really, really close run thing. So, you know, Churchill was hoping at the beginning of the evacuation that 30,000 people would get away. Um, I think Ramsey, who was um, in Dover, in, in, the, in the dynamo room at... Dover Castle orchestrating the evacuation, hence Operation Dynamo, um, thought 45,000. You know, these, the, the, and, and Churchill was often a very optimistic, you know, could had bouts of extreme optimism at times and pessimism. Um, but, you know, he, he thought 30,000 would be, would be a good figure. And the, the actual figure was, you know, 338. So it, it, it really was amazing. I mean, it truly, I mean, you, you know, again, often Churchill allowed language to run away with him, but um, to call it a miracle of deliverance is, is, is not untrue. True. What, what's a miracle? But I mean, it, you know, it's not, it's not a gross exaggeration, put it that way. And, you know, if you look at that speech that Churchill made after, <clears throat> he made on the night of the 4th, um, you know, fight them on the beaches, fight them on the landing ground. Um, it's an amazing speech because he's there's so much honesty in it. He's, he, he, he talks about um, a military disaster having taken place. He's not, you know, he's not, he's not sugarcoating. And he's talking, you know, he's speaking on so many levels at once. He's trying to bolster the French. He's trying to bolster his own people. But he's admitting, he's saying, the Germans are coming and we're going to have to fight them on the beaches, on the landing ground. Guerrilla warfare, they're coming. Um, and he's calling out to the Americans, to, calling out to the new world when all its power and might will come to the deliverance of the old. So he finishes. And he's saying to the American, my God, we need you. You know, we're, we, we, we're, please, please come in. Um, and, uh, and, and, but again, he's not, you know, he, call, he talks about this miracle of deliverance, but he says wars are not won by... Yeah. Evacuations, um, and it's it's a pretty <coughs> oh, excuse me, it's a pretty it's a pretty honest speech. Um, you know, there was a lot that Churchill did try and cover up at different times, and no point going into all that. But this speech, talking to the, the British people and the French and the Americans and others. It's pretty blunt. Well, according to the movie, when um, I talked earlier about uh, Mr. Dawson and, and his yacht that he's taking across, uh, throughout the movie, we, we see him going across the channel, but um, he goes across, it's daytime, and then when he comes back to Britain, it's dark. And so the impression I got there was he just went across once and then came back. Was that the case? Like they just went across once and, and back? or Because it was over multiple days. Oh, it's been. Oh, it no, absolutely depends on <laughs> multiple who stories. You're talking, like, about. You're talking about earlier. You know, the big ships went again and again and again and again. The naval ships and the um, some only went once and then were bombed and destroyed. I mean, something like a third of the ships that, that took part in the evacuation were either sunk or put out of action. Um, you have the little ships whose job, like I say, you know, the, 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 those small ships, their job was not to go across and bring people back. Their job was really <coughs> to take people from the beaches to the larger ships ashore. So they would stay there going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And then, of course, at the end, they come back and they probably have some people on board. But, um, you know, their job was not specifically to, 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 to take, you know, l large groups of people. So it all depended. 
um, you know, some some ships did it multiple times. So, for example, last time I was out there, I had um, dinner on in Dunkirk. There's this floating restaurant called the Princess Elizabeth, which is one of the Dunkirk ships. It's a paddle steamer that um, could take you know several hundred soldiers at once, um, and it was what it really was a bit of a paddle steamer. So it's one of those. Uh, like a small version of what went up and down the Mississippi, but but the its job was to take tourists from the south coast, Southampton, to the Isle of Wight, and it was called into action, and it ended up doing this, and it made four trips, and in total it brought home fourteen, fifteen, sixteen hundred men, something like that, um, and then a very similar ship, although bigger, was the. I've got a picture of this somewhere. It's the other paddle steamer. It is. Yeah, it's the other paddle steamer that's in still in Dunkirk, um, uh, and it's called Crested Eagle. And it was on the mole one day when the Stukas came in and came down, and it managed to get away. Uh, and it came parallel to the shore, and then it was attacked again by Stukas, which hit it this time. And the, the, the captain brought it, tried to beach it, brought it inshore, and mm. it sunk. And 300 or so people were killed, died on board, and, and that's it now. Oh, yeah. Um, if you can see it. Still in Dunkirk. And it's, you know, it's almost the same. It's bigger, but it's almost the same as the Princess Elizabeth. Um, but one is a restaurant serving food, and the other one is oh. visible at low tide. Um, and it's the most graphic sort of comparison. Um, and um, you know, and the Princess Elizabeth also. You know, this year it's, it's the Diamond Jubilee. Princess Elizabeth. It's called the Princess Elizabeth because it was built in 1926 when the current Queen was born. So it was named after her. To, you know, months after her birth, and it was launched in 1927. And so they're both. You know, Touchwood still doing well. One, one celebrating a golden jubilee, a diamond jubilee, and the other one <laughs> serving dinner. Uh, at, towards the end of the movie, after the men are rescued, the movie follows some of the soldiers on the train you we were talking about earlier. Uh, they arrive at uh, Woking Station, and one of the soldiers mentions how he just assumes they're the, the reaction is going to be that people are going to be spitting at them in the streets because of this. They had to retreat. They, it suggests that they feel like they've let their nation down. But instead, the reaction that they get is Ooh. they're greeted. They're handed beers, and everybody just seems happy that they're alive. What was the reaction to the returning soldiers mm. after the rescue? I, I think that's very accurate. I mean, you, you know, the, of the people I spoke to and the, the accounts that I came across, I mean, I think a lot of them um, felt that they were the sort of, how do you put it, the, the battered remnants of a defeated arm. And and, um, and they came back completely, you know, expecting expecting no welcome at all. Just to, and and they found that they were treated. A lot of them were treated as heroes. And they were, you know, people were cheering them and slapping them on the back and giving them sandwiches as they came in and buying them drinks in pubs and 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 it was. I mean, I suppose what that was was a kind of. You know, people often talk about Dunkirk spirit. It's a thing, Dunkirk spirit, that's sort of come down to us. It's often slated and, you know, it's used in every sort of, you know, during Brexit on both sides, people were talking, talking. Never mind that. Forget all that. What the instinctive Dunkirk spirit was a kind of relief um, that, first of all, you know, Uncle Bill is home. You know, relatives, and friends are, are coming home. They're here. But beyond that, that the country is still fighting, that you know that, that 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 we're not finished, and I think there was a real outpouring. If you look at the mass observation, mass observation was this organisation that um, people kept di- ordinary people kept diaries and they went to you know, different places to, to 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 look at the sort of social, the sort of anthropologists um, looking at Britain at the time, and it noted that there was a lot of immense relief. People. You know, suddenly buoyed um, by the fact that the country is still still fighting, um, and so there was this instinctive sense of relief. 
I think that was then taken up by the authorities who were trying to instill a sort of sense of um, that we're still in this. Was and that was you know so there were broadcasts on the radio and J.B. Priestley, the playwright, novelist, was you know broadcasting you know trying to instill this the sense in people and newspapers were doing it and um I, I, but but i think also you know the country if if you look at all sorts of odd things in the literally days after dunkirk um factory hours went up people were putting more time in and and sleeping in the factories and you know getting getting more done in 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 the furtherance of of of, of getting the war, you know, pe- of keeping this going, you having um, you having government. They're, they're still talking in, in the days, weeks after Dunkirk. They're talking about the government is actually discussing war aims, which is made. You know, what what are we fighting? For? And that's pretty amazing, considering you know what what's actually happening. And 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 the fact is, you know, you've got these members of the government, you know, real old. Um, Lord Halifax and these these fantastic old dinosaurs um, who are discussing, you know, how what are we fighting for, and the fact that you know people are going to have to um, have more consideration for each other now, and that you know financial gain isn't the be all and end all anymore. They, they were genuinely talking about it. Um, it's 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 quite a big sort of change shift in um, in emphasis, and so you know I think this. You know, like I say, Dunkirk spirit is 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 to some degree um, and in, it's imposed by the authorities, but to a great degree, it was absolutely organic, and it came out of this. Yeah, we're still going, and we can still keep going. And what is it that we're actually fighting for? And you find that a lot of things that we take for granted in this country now, education and and the, the National Health Service and things that. Um, you know, came in at the end of the war or after the war, had their roots at this time when we sub- when people suddenly started looking around and, well, who are we? Why are we fighting? What are, what what do we stand for as opposed to what they stand for? So, I think this just little period is is really important in the sort of social and cultural story of the war. It sounds very, I mean, very very different. You're talk- we're talking at the beginning about you know the Boer War, you know, like where. It sounds. It almost sounds. If correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the impression I get from from that is they they're going abroad to you know to see abroad, right? They even though there's this war going on, and now all of a sudden they've basically been snapped into. Okay, this is a war. What are we? What are we fighting for? What is this? Is serious? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, and I think and of course these things, you know, in reality, these things do you know turn around quickly, and and, and attitudes and reactions do change. Um, very quickly, and you know, it's all very well to talk about this, you know, this shift, this Dunkirk right. spirit. That doesn't mean it lasts forever. You know, these, these, you know, these, these changes in atmosphere, changes in attitudes, changes in expectations. You know, these can all happen very quickly. You know, like we were talking about the attitude to the RAF. Um, you know, people can, you know, Dunkirk spirit, blitz spirit, but these things change, and people who's you know one minute, in it, you know, are, are seeing. The world and and their place in it in a particular way can relatively quickly stop seeing, seeing it in a completely different way. Um, you know, we're talking about in in relation to you look at the way we all look at looking at um uh, at Ukraine at the moment, and there's the, the, there's a sense about well, the states, but there's a sense in Britain that you know we we are all looking at it in a particular way, and we're all you know very very interested in you know in 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 the in keeping um, Dunkirk going, uh, Ukraine going, but there's also a, a realization that things can, you know, if, if this war goes on for a long period of time, people can, to put it bluntly, it's horrible. People can get bored, and people can start looking elsewhere, and people can forget, you know, how keen they were to support Dun- to, to, Dunkirk, to support Ukraine at, um, at, at, at an early stage. Attitudes do change. Um, in a relatively short period of time, towards things that we think are immensely important in the short term. So, in the in the same way, you know, attitudes towards attitudes that were changed by Dunkirk could change back very quickly. People could, you know, by blitz spirit, which is another thing which was organic and was real. 
I believe, but it, it didn't necessarily last that. Um, and um, you've got to be aware of this, that when, when, when you're looking at, at, at reactions and, 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 and people's attitudes, they're not carved in stone. Um, and just like the, you know, the, the RAF was hated and loved, these things change. I want to ask, uh, throughout the movie, some of the characters that we've talked about, uh, Farrier, uh, Mr. Dawson, uh, Tommy and Gibson on, on the beach, um, were these characters based on real people or were they amalgamations to tell the overall story? My, my signal oh. completely failed there. I didn't, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear what you said. Uh, throughout the movie, I mentioned some of the characters, you know, Mr. Dawson on, on the boats, uh, on the beach, you know, there's uh, Tommy and Gibson, British soldiers, um, or fr- British and then a French soldier pretending to be British so he could leave. Uh, were these characters based on real people or were they amalgamations to basically tell the story? They were amalgamations, I think it's fair to say. Um, the, I mean, there the, the were real, so, you know, the story of Light Honor, for example, was definitely something that the director was aware of. Um, and, and, and there were so many stories, real stories, that were, you know, um, out there that he found or I found, you know, went into the, the mix. Um, that's, uh, I think they, I think it's right to say they were amalgams. Um, there was no real need to take anybody's story, you know, um, and in the same way, the naval officers were, you know, inspired by different people that they, you know, that were part of the real story, but there's no way that anybody was, um, representing a particular person, so I think um, I think you know I I I, I don't know because I you know it wasn't my film, but I suspect um, that you know to 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 make anybody too close to to to, to the real person is almost a livid. Um, you know it it it's um it, it, in the end the story is a fiction based in a real. Um, uh, you know, in a real theater and, and, um, to, 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 re- to, to tie one character down to reality would, would not be fair almost. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. And we have talked about some of the impressions that I got while watching the movie, um, but I think everyone walking away from a movie gets different impressions from the story that was told. So what's something that you want to make sure that someone watching this movie walks away with? Well, Ooh, that's a good question. Well, I suppose I've already said it really that, you know, that what I'd like anybody who sees the movie to be at, at least aware that there's no one story. And there never is. You know, it's, it, the world, life doesn't work that way. Um, it just doesn't. And, and um, you know, I mean, I, I think there's so many interesting dramas nowadays that. Focus on. I, I just say this. We, I've just been watching it. There's an uh, American series called This Is Us, um, and you know it, it. It look. It takes it takes a family and looks at them over a period of years and goes backwards and forwards and it plays with time and it plays with Christopher Nolan famously plays with time, um, but it looks at the same event from different people's perspective and you realise it does it well because you realise we don't see things different. We don't see things the same. We we, we all interpret everything differently and 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 the real story is is different um if depending on when what time and where you're at the beach you know you're going to have a a different perspective so i i i i'd want you to come away with that it's a, it's a broad it's not just about dunkirk it's about yeah. everything you've ever done um one thing that i was very i mean i, I think this might be worth i find this quite interesting your your viewers can decide if they agree but one thing that I, when I was in Dunkirk, I always find that um, so, so being somewhere can really inform you about an event that took place up there, um, however many years before it was. So, so I, I found this story which fascinated me, which was that um, there was a, a, a signals, a naval signals commander called, uh, I think his name was Emerson, uh, who wrote, I found all this in the British National Archives at, at a Marconi transmitter had been brought to Dunkirk because one of the big problems that Sky Ten I was talking about had was communicating with ships offshore, communicating with 
um, Ramsey back in Dover can just basically communicate. Um, because obviously none of this has been planned in advance. The communications have been set up. And while there was an undersea link between um, La Pan and Dover, there wasn't anything where he was, which is actually in Dunkirk. So for part of the time, he was using the French transmitter, which is back at the French um, headquarters. Part of the time, he was going to ships that were on the mole and using their transmitters to talk to Dover or to, to other ships. What, none of this was ideal. So he had uh, a trans Marconi transmitter brought over, and it was brought in to, you know, to, to, to beat. And I read this account, and it said it was brought over, and then it was in use for a few hours, and then it broke, it stopped working, because it got sand in the generator. I'm so fascinated by this, because I thought, you know, they've, they've gone to the effort to bring this huge, great, state-of-the-art Marconi transmitter, and it gets sand. You know, they, it's only in use for a few hours because it's get all sanded up. And I was sort of thinking, well, how do they, how are they so complacent to let, you know, and I have almost this picture of you know, a couple of naval ratings sort of yeah. moving it and dropping it in the sand. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and I really, I, you know, it's like Laurel and Hardy. I, I couldn't. And then when, when I was there for a period, long period of time, and you realize that when the wind, the wind really gets up, even in summer, and when the wind gets up, it becomes like a sort of hmm. desert sandstorm where, not quite like a desert sandstorm, but it becomes pretty fierce. And so people, everyone was sort of walking around with goggles and with, sort of, you know, pre-COVID masks around them and, and, and things wrapped around their faces. And, and it was really, really difficult to, to function. And it occurred to me that well, that's probably what happened. It, probably the wind blew and 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 it just silted up the the thing and it, it, it then couldn't be used. And that's what I mean by sometimes you have to be at a place to really, you know, the the the, the, the location actually informs the history. And I found that very moving, actually, that you know, to to, to, to be there at the same time of year. And the weather wasn't particularly bad, but there were periods when it just got so windy that it, w it became almost unbearable. It just whipped up, and and I think the lesson there, if there is one, is sometimes you have to go to a place to really begin to understand what yeah. might have happened. Um, yeah, no, that the makes day. sense. That the location is also a character in in history, for sure, for sure. Since you got to work on the movie, what's one? Of, what's your favorite story from your time on the production? <laughs> oh, my. oh, my favorite story. Well, there's that one. I think. I mean, I suppose another one. Another one. There, well, maybe two. One is that there was a screening before the film was actually out there released. There was a screening for veterans that was done in London at, at a small cinema. And my God, that was moving. I mean, all of these, and you know, I, I, there really aren't any left. I mean, there may be some, but not, none that I know. And, but I don't know how many, 20, 25 of the veterans with their families came um, and sat there watching this attempt to recreate demonstrate their experience and the, the 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 director christopher nolan was so much more nervous about how they reacted to the film than how any critic or any you know any anybody else he wanted it to be he wanted it to be acceptable to them um and i found that very moving and 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 the fact that you know these people who had been there a lifetime they were they were kids actually when they were there and here they were now with you know their great grandchildren some of whom were now in the military there was one man who's who's had a great grandchild who's in uniform and you just oh my god it, it, it's yeah. it's almost too much to get your head around and there they were sitting in the audience watching it and that was very moving this was another thing that i 
remember is the day that the director first showed up at my house and um bought my flat i got in the flat in london um and um uh you know he, he, he showed up and we chatted and he showed me the, the script and he left the script with me overnight which is i later realized is not something he tends to do he's very oh, he's quite secretive over over his scripts and i um and it was it all happened quite quickly and so it was it came as a you know it, it was sort of a as not something i was expecting um and so it was and you know to, to do what i do to write books and you do it, it, it's an interesting life it's not a particular uh, <clears throat> um that you don't know what's coming next um could be good could be bad <laughs> it's always interesting um um, and this was a particularly interesting little, um, you know, period of, of, of my working life. So yeah, it was, yeah. I'm, I'm very grateful. Well, thank you so much for coming on to chat about Dunkirk. Speaking of books, not only were you the historical consultant on the movie, you also wrote the book adaptation, uh, called Dunkirk, the history behind the major motion picture. So for someone listening to this, who wants to learn more, Maybe can you give us one of your favorite stories from the real history that didn't make its way into the movie from the book that, and where they can pick up a copy of oh, it? God. Um, oh, gosh, a real <laughs> story. Just, uh, the tough questions at the end, sorry. I can't remember. Um, oh, God, there's, there are so many um, just, you know, fantastic stories of, of, you know, all the way through running from the, well, I mean, I sort of running from the, you know, the political, the fact that there were people in cabinet who wanted to mm. make peace, who wanted to approach Hitler through, um, uh, through the uh, the Italian ambassador because he was not not yet in the war, and, and how different things would have turned out if if if, if that approach had been taken. Um, to you know, God knows how many personal. You know, unbelievably personal stories of, of um, yeah, okay, here's one, here's one. I um, this to me is sort of sums up how strange it was. You had these passenger ships that were coming, um, and coming alongside the mole. These large, you know, I've talked about Crest Eagle and others, but even bigger than that, you know, these really big ferries, really, that were that were coming to pick people up, and this. One. And they were full of, you know, people working on board who, when they were ferries, were working on board. And so one man talks about the fact, an officer talks about the fact that they were in terrible state. They got up the mole, they walked over dead bodies to get on board the ship. They clambered on. This man said he collapsed in the corner, just a quiet corner, and just, you know, passed out. And he said he was woken up um, almost immediately by a man in a white coat who came up to him and said, would you, could I get you anything? And he looked up and he said, you're not, are you a steward? And the man said, yes, sir, I am. So this was a passenger ship with its stuff. This was a waiter that came up to him, he, you know, he, and that asked him if he wanted it. And he said he just couldn't believe it after the, the hell he just experienced. Here, he was a waiter. And he said, well, I, I, no, I don't suppose uh, Get me a glass of beer, and and the man said, "Well, I, I I would sir, but I'm sure you know the rules. I'm not allowed to serve alcohol till we're three miles offshore." And he said, "He said at that moment, I thought with people like this, how can we lose the war? I mean, you know, it 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 was a moment for him where he stepped out of the hell of Dunkirk and onto this ship where a man said, "Well, I'd love to get you a beer, sir, but I can't do that until we we've moved offshore." And and he said, uh, yeah, it kind of sums up the weirdness of the whole event, that the improvised nature of it, the fact that, you know, everyone was called to called in to help. And even the waiter who absolutely will stick to the rules and love to get you a beer, but can't get it. Wow. I, I mean, and yeah, I mean, that's even similar to what we've been talking, the contrast, you know, the this. From beginning to end. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Sounds up the yeah. Well, thank you yeah. again so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's learned a lot. I'm glad. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's nice 
it's great talking about it. I mean, I was, you know, like I said, I was just, I was in Dunkirk a week ago. It's the first time I've been back for ages. And it, it really, it was, it was wonderful to be, to go back and to, to, you know, have all the, the memories sort of of the film and of the veterans and, um, you know, the whole story sort of stirred up again in me. And, um, and I strongly recommend, you know, if people want to go and visit, it's a, it's, it's a very, very emotive um, place to visit. Um, so I, I strongly recommend it. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. I'd like to thank Joshua Levine once again for sharing his expertise about the history behind Dunkirk. If you want to hear more about the true story, I would highly recommend picking up a copy of Joshua's book called Dunkirk, the history behind the major motion picture. As always, you can find links to that book in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, the senior most surviving officer from the Titanic helped in the Dunkirk evacuation. Number two, Churchill didn't expect to evacuate anyone from Dunkirk. Number three, people not in the Navy who took their boats signed a form to become temporary members of the Royal Navy. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's go backwards and we'll start with number three. People not in the Navy who took their boats signed a form to become temporary members of the Royal Navy. That is true. As Joshua explained, non-members of the Navy who took their boats across ended up signing a form that made them temporary members of the Royal Navy. That brings us to number two. Churchill didn't expect to evacuate anyone from Dunkirk. That's the lie. We learned that Churchill was hopeful to rescue about 30,000 from Dunkirk, but when all was said and done, over 338,000 people were rescued. That means number one is also true. The senior most surviving officer from the Titanic helped in the Dunkirk evacuation. As we learned, Charles Lightoller was the senior most member of the crew to survive the Titanic disaster. That was in 1912. Then in 1940, he used his own ship to help with the Dunkirk evacuation. Last but not least, it's time now to let you know how long it took to create this episode. If you're a long time listener to the podcast, you'll know that I like to share this information just to help you appreciate all the podcasts you listen to. After all, a huge majority of podcasts are like mine, completely free to listen to, but that doesn't mean that they're free to create. Quite the opposite. Even though podcasts don't always cost a lot of money, they almost always cost a lot of time. The time it takes to learn the technical side to begin with, the research to create them on an ongoing basis, to record them, to edit them, and so on. But I only have the stats for my own show. So with that in mind, today's episode took me 41 hours to create. And to make it clear, that's only my time. It doesn't include any of Joshua's time. And to be even more specific, it isn't even all of my time because that 41 hours is only the time it took for me to produce this one episode. It doesn't include all the time I spend building, maintaining the base on a true story website, finding new guests, scheduling, logistics, social media, and so on. All those things don't really have anything to do with making today's episode specifically, but they're still required overall to make the podcast. In a nutshell, this podcast may be free to listen to, but it is not free to create. And that's why I'm so thankful for the sponsors whose ads you've heard on this episode. You can find out more information about them over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash advertisers. But they're not the only ones helping to keep the show alive. There are wonderful people just like you who are helping to keep this show financially going. So if you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll consider supporting the next episode over at based on a true story podcast.com slash support. Once again, that's based on a true story podcast.com slash support. And don't forget, if you want to chat about this episode, you can do that over in the based on a true story Facebook group. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. And I'll chat with you again really soon. <laughs>